I declare the meeting of the committee open and advise that this meeting of the committee meeting will be streamed live and recorded for publishing to the internet. Please note that an audio and visual recording is being taken of this meeting, and this means that your presence at and any contribution you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed or published publicly by the Council, including transferring outside of Australia. Council acknowledges that we are meeting on traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pays respects to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. We acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. And we also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who are present today. Uh, we have two, uh, uh, we have one person on leave, which is Councillor Abia, the Deputy Lord Mayor, and we have one apology, which is Councillor Hyatt. Can I have a mover and a seconder for the motion that the minutes of the meeting of the committee held on 1 October 2019 be taken as read and be confirmed as an accurate record of proceedings? Uh, Councillor Sims and Councillor Canal, thank you. Can I put that to the vote? All those in favour, by show of hands, and all those against? That is carried. And our first, first discussion item is item 4.1, local government reform. And I'd like to invite Mark to intro that for us. Thanks, Chair. Um, council members would recall this, um, this reform package was given a, a thorough um, review by Alex Hart from the Office of Local Government. She came in and spoke to us about all of the aspects of the reform process. Um, and I, th I think it's really important that as a capital city, uh, we have strong views and strong input into the reform process. And tonight is really about formulating that. You know, there are four key areas of interest from, from the reform. Um, the first one being governance and conduct. Secondly, financial accountability and efficiency. Thirdly, representation. And finally, simpler regulation. And those things have been quite well set out in the paper that you have. Um, Sue and Jess are here today to help us work through the four key areas, but also any other aspects that you want to bring forward tonight is a good opportunity to do that. I want to reiterate though, tonight no decisions can be made. It's a workshop, um, but we can certainly get your feedback. And um, I must say that I anticipate that there will be differing views with your feedback, um, which is fine. What we will do, we will aim to record those differences of opinion. Uh, where we consider them to be significant, we will be sure that in the report that goes to Council, it has to go to Council next Tuesday to ensure we meet with the deadline for feedback to, to the reform process. Uh, we will ensure that any points of difference are called out specifically in the report so that you can debate and determine appropriately in the right way. So that's the, that's the intent. Um, I also remind council members that you are individually able to make any submission you like as a member of the community, as is anyone else. So um, you have that opportunity as well. So what we might do is hand over now to, to Sue and Jess to lead us through um, the paper that we have before us. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Chair. Um, so Jess and I have uh, pulled together these slides to um, help pull out some of the items that we think council members might like to discuss this evening. However, that's only a guide as to um, some of the key issues and um, as Mark's already said, uh, we need to hear from you on any of the 72 proposals that the government has put forward and indeed any that they haven't put forward and we've highlighted some of those as well for you. As Mark has said, this is part of an ongoing reform process and uh, the response is due on the 1st of November. Now, in terms of reform area one, governance and conduct, um, the two uh, areas that we've pulled out for discussion um, are that of uh, sorry, the uh, request for an improved conduct management framework and we were keen to hear from members as to your views so that we can help formulate the res response for next week. Councillor Sims, I saw a hand there. Did you want to respond? Was that to that question or to no, the other questions? No, I was just going to give some general 
and feedback. Is now an opportunity to do that, or would you prefer to go through each of the issues? Do you want to go through the ones question one, one, two, three, four, and seek it in that order, or would you? I think that would be helpful. Maybe have some structure yeah, in terms of then how we can structure this report. Were your questions on reform area one? And no, they weren't questions. questions. They were just some feedback, general general issues. I guess um, I can talk to the governance and conduct uh, element. Um, so I'm not sure where. Uh, sorry, um, I'm not sure where the um, issues that I was going to identify would um, best fit. So governance strikes me as being most appropriate. Um, one of the issues that I've uh, talked about um, previously, and indeed I think this council has formed a position on, is um, around a disclosure of political party memberships. Um, and I think that's something that is worth um, highlighting in our own submission to the, um, the government. If it has been highlighted and I've missed it, I'm sorry about that, I didn't see it in here. Um, the, the other issue I wanted to um, Identify, and I know there are different views among the council table around this, but I think it's still worth mentioning, um, is around um, caps on the amount of money that people can spend in elections and uh, disclosure of donations uh, received before um, people vote. Um, it strikes me as uh, being a poor process that uh, asks candidates to disclose the donations that they've received after they've been elected, um, not before. Um, because that means that members of the community don't have the opportunity to uh, assess what influence such donations may have had on the, the democratic process. So I think um, the community has a right to that information and they should get it before they cast their vote. Um, so I, I'd like to encourage councillors to uh, support that. In terms of so, the, so we actually have done some work on that? Uh, yes, I think reform area three, there are right. two questions there. Um, <coughs> The first of those uh, is addressed in Reform Area 3, um, I believe, which is the efficient and transparent local government representation. Um, uh, okay. Yes, so I believe that already is. The other, the second issue we spoke about, um, I think, was raised uh, when Council discussed this in April for its original <coughs> submission to the uh, reforms. Um, and at that point, um, Council didn't support the view that you've yes. councillor, um, but that of course can be one of the proposals that's put to council next week. Yeah, and I, I may well put that as an individual submission as well, but I just thought yeah. it might be good to, um, to flag it. I guess the other um, point I wanted to make around the governance is I know there are some changes here around giving the Lord Mayor a deliberative vote and meetings, um, which I don't uh, have a problem um, with. Um, but my uh, view is that if you do that, then there, there should be a separation out with the chairing roles for the reasons that I've identified previously. That's not a criticism of the um, of the Lord Mayor at all. Um, it's a reflection on just how I perceive the, the roles, the, the distinction between what I think is a political role and then an independent umpire role. Um, so I think if we're going to give uh, the Lord Mayor the opportunity to and be a standalone member of the council um, with a deliberative vote, then it's not appropriate for them to um, have you know new powers in the area of discipline um, over meetings. And Councillor Abraham today, reform area one, your comments? Yes, yes. all of my points uh, relate to reform area one. Thank you for the wonderful work. Um, I've noticed here that uh, you've uh, put in a range of powers for management by presiding members and um, uh, I know that that is kept fairly vague, so uh, feel free to take this on board. I'm not sure whether it's too detailed or not, but uh, I guess I'll uh, share it with you guys, and the members here. Um, so one of the things that um, uh, I'd personally like to see is uh, um, increased powers to, to the presiding members, maybe something like three strikes and, uh, and the members out. These are for members that might be misbehaving. Uh, another uh, one is um, uh, suspension without pay. So if uh, any of the members uh, are misbehaving, uh, whether suspension is something that we could look at, uh, and well, that's not just suspending them from attending meetings, but sus suspending them uh, without pay. Um, that's if that code of conduct is upheld. So uh, uh, that's something to, uh, to I guess, you know, note. Um, <coughs> The number of uh, um, code of conduct complaints against the particular member, whether if that 
can be made public, whether if that can be published. I guess we all have our um, profiles uh, published on, um, um, on the council website. So whether if that's something that can be, uh, I guess, stuck next to our uh, profiles, I think uh, that will make some members, uh, uh, I think that will make all of us think twice before uh, you know, we say or act. Um, in, a, uh, in a disrespectful manner. Um, uh, oh, and also the last point was around breaching confidentiality. Whether if there is, uh, whether if there is anything in, in that submission, I didn't see anything around that, but whether if there is, uh, if there's anything around uh, breaching confidentiality and whether if the person that is breaching confidentiality, whether if there are any consequences for that. Um, through the chair, so there's there's a couple of things I'll raise. Um, so with the uh, proposals around the Lord Mayor, um, all mayor's capacity to rule over meetings and um, uh, manage behaviour, there is a proposal specifically spelt out that to give the mayor or Lord Mayor more powers in that capacity during meetings. There is also another one, um, Councillor Sims, your um, suggestion around the deliberative vote. So they're two separate proposals out of the 72. Um, the, around the conduct, um, code of conduct complaints, so under uh, the freeform area one, uh, there's a number of models proposed around uh, conduct. And so last time we were here a fortnight ago, I think the consensus was to look at model one, which was really reviewing that legislation, making that tighter, and um, model three, which was a conduct commissioner. Um, so brief, uh, model one looks at reporting through the annual report any code of conduct complaints. So there would be that public reporting requirement as well. Um, breaching confidentiality, not specifically mentioned through the reforms, but again, it would be addressed through that conduct commissioner um, and looking at consequences to breaching of the code of conduct um, aligned with the review of the current legislation. Sure, thank you. And a little bit. Um, thank you, just a clarification, Jess. My understanding is that they're asking us which model we support. So model one being the clarification of legislation and model three being a um, government, local government commissioner. So I'm not sure how we can talk to both of them, at, you know, in terms of putting, because what they're asking is which model do we support? Are we just saying we support both of them? That's just... Um, uh, through the chat, yes. So um, OLG said that we can uh, mix what works for us. So we can t take a bit of one and three and say, this is what the framework should look like. Or alternatively, we can come up with a different solution as well and put that in our proposals. So um, given the feedback we've already received, we thought it's a mix of one and three at this stage. Um, so, and in terms of um, I support Councillor Sims in terms of the Lord Mayor or a Mayor having a deliberative vote rather than casting vote. Um, we had a very quick chat on that earlier today and, um, you know, the reality is that the number of votes that a Mayor or a Lord Mayor gets is greater than any of the numbers of any individual councillors on council and therefore there is an expectation that the Lord Mayor will, you know, deliver on um, what they've gone to the electorate with. Um, and so having the ability to have that deliberate vote, which is very clearly, you know, speaking to uh, the, um, the endorsement of council or the decision of council, I think would be good. Um, uh, I, I don't support there being an independent chair. I think that uh, I've been on many, many boards and you can chair quite impartially as well as actually having the limited vote. I don't think they're excluded, they exclude each other. Um, and I do think to <coughs> Councillor uh, Abraham today's um, point that the confidentiality isn't called out and should probably be something that we just roll into if there's a strengthening of the legislation or an appointment of a commissioner that, that actually also gets wrapped up in there. Councillor Sims, did you have another comment on Reform Area 1? Uh, yes, just, uh, just some questions. Is there any proposal to um, do a, strengthen the provisions around pre-meetings with groups? I haven't seen, I know that we were talking about potentially relaxing some of those um, requirements. Um, but yeah, but, but is there anything to deal with kind of the concept of pre-caucusing before meetings? Uh, 
yes, that is covered in um, reform area four. So we're again. Sorry, I know I'm going across. That's okay. Some, some of them don't. It's very wide ranging. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so amendment of informal gatherings provisions at reform areas 4.7 and 4.8. So a proposal has been made by the government to remove the informal gatherings provisions and establish said informational briefing sessions and also to require councils to publish details of those sessions before and where possible. But would it still be unlawful to have uh, meetings of a informal... Council Sims, can you switch on your mic? Sorry, Chair. Would it still be considered unlawful to have um, meetings uh, of um, councillors the, you know, a core at meeting. So I think my understanding of the current legislation is that if you had, you know, about half of the council meeting and discussing council business before council meetings, that is uh, in breach. Would that be still the case under what the government? Are... I would presume so, but we haven't. Uh, sorry, through the chair, we haven't seen you know, the detailed provisions. These are quite uh, high level proposals at this stage, but I would imagine so. Because I think that's important. I mean, I, I don't mind relaxing the um, I, don't, I don't mind relaxing the rules around uh, informal uh, CEO briefings and so on. Um, but I think it's important that we do prevent pre caucusing. And Councillor Martin, was your point for reform area one? Uh, yes, uh, I have a couple of points, um, and I have made the point before. And I, I notice we don't support that, but I do want to emphasise again. And I'm making very general comments here, not about any specific circumstance, but in a highly politicised environment where it's proposed to give a presiding member disciplinary penalty uh, powers over elected members, there is always a chance that a, um, a presiding member may be a member of the faction which controls the council, and therefore there will be a perception that that action, community uh, penal action, may be as a consequence of a desire to reach a particular political outcome. Um, and I fear that there's also a threat in there um, in respect of bullying, uh, so that individuals may feel reluctant to speak because of the fear of being penalised. Uh, and I fear also there is a possibility that a threat to penalise somebody um, may in fact lead them to not speak, to not put forward a particular proposal. And moreover, in the wrong hands, there is the potential that a particular argument may be sought to be excluded from a debate simply by using inappropriate powers uh, related to powers to exclude. Um, if I may, through the chair. Um, I think that the government is you know, alive to that threat. Part of their proposal has noted that um, any misuse of such enhanced powers could be treated as um, an integrity breach within the new conduct framework that they're proposing. And so in the administration comment that we're considering, um, we would be noting that need for a consistent framework to deal with misuse. If, but um, this is clearly one uh, item that should be drawn out in recommendations next week for a council position. <coughs> and there would be a penalty associated with that integrity breach? Integrity breach would, yes. Okay, okay. well that's good news. Um, uh, just in respect of um, a couple of other things that are covered in this first part, um, the conflict of interest exemptions, I don't agree with that. Um, uh, except in very broad matters of class, as the legislation currently allows. Mm -hmm. If you are a large, a member of a large class, a rate payer, uh, then you should be able to strike rates. Um, if you're a business person, you should be able to talk about uh, business policy. But if you're a member of a very narrow class, then I think there ought to be restrictions still uh, within the local government um, uh, regulations or legislation, uh, so that, for example, if you're a uh, you know a peanut seller and you're discussing the sale of peanuts in the city, you should be excluded because that is a very narrow class. Uh, and similarly, that could be said, and I'm happy uh, to entertain arguments about this. If you're a landlord, it's not appropriate to be debating matters. Uh, concerning uh, obligations and responsibilities of landlords. 
So um, it does need to very clearly distinguish between broad class and then narrow it down to those specific classes. Um, not least because I think everyone in here needs uh, not only to act impartially, but to be seen to be impartial by, by being excluded. Um, pretty much, if you're required to put it on the register of interests, um, then it probably means there'll be many occasions when you will not be able to participate. Um, now, they're just general comments I emphasise, uh, personal views. Um, the Local Government Conduct Commissioner, oh, sorry, you want to respond? Just a query, if I might, through the Chair, to clarify for the purpose of our report. Um, so the proposal that instead of material, actual and perceived conflicts, there be material and non-material conflicts is neither here nor there. You have a different set Yep, I think if you've got a conflict, you've got a conflict. Um, um, and I think uh, that, that needs to be a uh, principle. I mean, uh, you know, minor, minor conflicts uh, to one side, but uh, I'm talking about those conflicts that do create a perception problem in uh, the broader community. Um, and so far as the Local Government Conduct Commissioner um, is concerned, I, I actually think I can support that, um, provided that the, uh, the Commissioner uh, had clearly defined powers and that, you know, the, uh, the individual uh, himself or herself um, was regarded as someone who was um, separated from the local government process, you know, a former judge, someone of that, that, that order. Um, and moreover, I think one of the things that's missing in this whole discussion is vexatious reporting. Uh, now, I've heard, you know, talk about uh, code of conducts and uh, the, the mounting code of conducts having uh, some kind of impact on um, your capacity to sit in here. But the truth of the matter is code of conduct complaints can be vexatious. And I'm wondering if it, there are penalties uh, to apply to uh, people making vexatious um, uh, complaints. Yeah. <clears throat> um, through you, Chair, that was one of the um, suggestions that was put forward by Council in April, but not picked up in this round of um, reforms was to deter vexatious or frivolous um, complaints. So yep. one of the uh, suggestions, I guess, is that um, we put that forward uh, and reiterate that again, if Council approves that. That would be good. Yeah. Is Thank that you. already there, though? No, it's not in the proposals. It was in but the, isn't it already in the... Um, these are the changes to, aren't they? Having just gone through a code of conduct, that was explained to me very clearly if I could, you know, if it was shown that the uh, complainant was, um, was doing it vexatiously, there were severe penalties. Mm -hmm. So that's not true? Well, I think that the request that we put in April was to strengthen slash clarify. Oh, good. Okay. And Thank you. final comments on reform area one, Jesse, Councillor Garrett. Thanks, Chair. Um, look, I think that a, uh, I think an independent conduct commissioner uh, is a good idea. I think we should support that. I think that it uh, is in line uh, with public expectations uh, in uh, over recent times. I think that it would give uh, the public a certain level of comfort, um, and uh, I think I think it, it, it is something that uh, is, is, is warranted uh, now. Um, I, as for an independent chair, as a, as opposed to the Lord Mayor sitting, I, I'm I'm not in favour of that because the uh, the the issue is whether or not uh, elected members uh, feel that they have adequate recourse uh, should there be a situation of bias or otherwise, and that is exactly the type of thing they would have recourse to a code of conduct commissioner um, were one to be put in. So I, I think that's a, a step too far. Um, uh, deliberative vote. The Lord Mayor, I do agree with that. I think that's probably something the public assume is the case um, already. And finally, um, I, I've just came in at the end of the discussion about uh, code of conduct complaints. Um, there should not be, a, there should not absolutely not be a public record of code of conduct complaints as such. That cuts right against procedural fairness. Uh, you, you do not publicise complaints as such. You publicise complaints that have been found uh, to have been uh, warranted. So only after a finding, after procedural fairness has been undertaken, should there be publicising of a finding. Um, and I think that further, 
uh, publicising findings simply alongside a councillor's name, uh, bereft of any of the other sort of achievements of the councillor, is a little bit unfair. There ought to be a register where people can easily access, easily access code of conduct findings, uh, but not complaints uh, themselves. Thank you. And reform area two, financial accountability and efficiency. Do any councillors wish to comment on that reform area? Councillor Martin. Well, I'm happy to go out to someone else. Okay. Um, uh, look, in respect of 2.2.3, which is uh, audit committee, as someone who sits on the audit committee, um, um, it seems extraordinary we're saying in here that uh, it may be overly prescriptive to require the committee to oversight internal audit plan, which is exactly what we do. Um, and so I, I find it extraordinary that while we're establishing really good practices through the audit committee that in fact we boast about, um, I, I wouldn't see why we're not out there being a champion for those kinds of roles for audit committee. Um, and in respect of 2.6, where the Auditor General is required, I, I just don't understand why we wouldn't want to encourage, um, you know, more oversight where it was required, um, regardless of the cost. And the sort of thing I'm talking about now is where, for example, <coughs> there is, you know, financial mismanagement not on a macro level, but a micro level. And, and that's where I think an external set of eyes would be useful in a council, particularly where, say, you know, you've got a capital works project and it starts at six or seven million dollars and it ends up trebling. That is something that rightfully someone like an Auditor General could be helpful um, in guiding a council with. Um, and additionally, 2.7 and 2.11, the Audit Risk Committee, um, I actually don't understand why, when we're already doing that through our own audit committee, we wouldn't want to have um, somebody reporting on the governance of the organisation, why we wouldn't want to be, you know, introspective. Um, it's a reasonable thing for us to do that. Um, and finally, at 2.12, more powers for the um, uh, presiding member to penalise elected members, uh, elected members opposing external audit by audit committee, as is suggested here possibly, oppose external supervision by the audit committee, <coughs> oppose the committee to look at governance. I, I think those things are actually starting to send a, a message out there that we're not as um, interested in transparency as we might be. Um, and I think those that suite um, would make us a much more accountable organisation rather than one that seemed to be putting forward a package that avoids transparency. Um, through the chair, I'll just add some further context on the um, points you raised. So the audit committee becoming a risk and audit committee um, and looking at internal audit plans. You're right, uh, the City of Adelaide audit committee already performs as a risk and audit committee. Um, the reason that it is um, draft as opposed at the moment is um, being overly prescriptive for an area that councils are already, um, most metropolitan councils are already um, doing best practice. So uh, the administration comment in there is there maybe is a role for the local government association to play around best practice instead of prescriptive legislation. Um, however, again, taking feedback on that, the Auditor General having oversight of um, audit committees. Um, so the Auditor General already has powers to come into councils um, and perform financial <laughs> or performance-based audits. Yes, so they've already got that um, power. The Auditor General has clearly said, and you might remember from our original submission, we, we um, supported the fact that the Auditor General could keep a list of independent audit committee members that are trained and qualified. The Auditor General has said they either get the whole lot or none at all. So they either get the whole financial external audit, um, that would come with a significant cost to councils and due to resourcing around the whole sector, we might be getting the same consultants come in, which would be a consistent methodology supplied by the Auditor General if that proposal was to go ahead. Um, the other uh, 
thing you mentioned was around the governance committee. So there's there's a number of proposals in there around creating a, a separate governance committee. Um, two weeks ago, uh, feedback was we we probably don't need another another level of committee. Um, but you're right, there is another proposal in there that it's a risk audit slash governance committee as well. Um, where pre feedback provided at the moment is not to give that committee so many roles and responsibilities that they can really focus on that risk and financial basis. However, if, if it's um, the feedback of council that that should be extended to governance matters as well, we could propose that. Now, just as a point of clarity, I, I'm not talking about that broader committee which examined, for example, the conduct of meetings and so on. I am talking about the, the governance and the risk within the, uh, the organisation as a whole. Um, and just as a matter of principle, uh, and I do understand uh, the sentiment that um, we shouldn't allow government to be overly prescriptive, but if we're already doing things, then it's, it's not a reason to say, no, let's not proceed. And the only analogy I can think is, you know, um, it's not enough to say, look, I don't steal cars, so we don't need anti-theft car laws. Um, you know, it, it is still useful to have those for circumstances when they may be necessary. Um, and for us, it should be the least painful exercise because we are doing these things already. And I think there's much to be said for a council that advocates um, and says, look, will do as we already practice and we recommend it work with others. So reform area two, Lynette. Um, thank you. And just responding um, to that, actually, Jess, you probably covered off a lot of the uh, response that I was just going to say. We, the, the fact is, and Councillor Martin, we do do best practice, but there are 68 councils in South Australia and not all of them have audit and risk committees, not all of them, you know, go through the same processes of best practice that we do. And so this this reform is across all of the councils. Now, I think, you know, um, we at the City of Adelaide do actually do best practice and we do have external members on our audit committee. We do have uh, go through audit and risk and um, and we go through a process of appointing an external auditor, etc. Um, this plan would then take that to the Auditor General's Department, who would then appoint an auditor on our behalf because they wouldn't be able to do it themselves, which will most likely be the same auditor that we're already appointing. It's just there's a whole layer of cost that goes with that that is unnecessary given the process that we currently have. Um, so it's a matter of uh, it's it's not it's not anything to do with you know transparency or whatever. It's actually that perhaps the city of Adelaide needs to be looked at separately or differently um, because we have all of these best practice processes in place already, and so for for us to take what we're already doing to an ex to the auditor general who then is going to give it back to us to get us to do it the same way just seems um, a little bit uh, uh, too much anyway. Um, so that's, that's really, um, this is guiding those councils that don't currently have audit, don't currently have audit and risk, don't currently have external bodies on their audit and risk and don't have those cost checks and balances in place. Um, in terms of the governance committee, um, I think that's, I'm not sure if we've had this conversation with the Audit and Risk Committee, but I do think that this is probably one of the areas, that's 2.12, uh, where it actually would be good to have a conversation with the Audit Committee to see how they would feel about taking on um, governance around compliance on policies. Councillor Moran. Just on that, on the Audit Committee, um, this, is, um, this is local government reform, not Adelaide City Council Correct. reform, and uh, I don't think we should oppose that because we already do something similar. We should show leadership with a, with a mothership. Um, I think we could put an addendum there saying, look, uh, maybe we could be treated differently, but we totally support this move because all councils should do what we do. And this ensures that reform. So while I can see where the Lord Mayor's coming from, I think she has to put herself as the head of the League Council. And just because we're doing something, it'll inconvenience us. Um, it'll be 
good for all local government. So uh, it's just a matter of how it's worded. I think it's a good idea. We think it's a good idea, but maybe we can be exempt because we're already doing it. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So any final comments on reform area two? Just a quick question. The, the Lord Mayor raises an interesting point in saying this is too costly or that's too costly. As an administration, what do we regard as a reasonable expenditure on governance and managing uh, risk and also compliance? I mean, what, what, what is, do you expect to spend two and six a year, 2.5 million, 25 million? I mean, what, what is a reasonable expectation of cost? It's not possible to say what a reasonable expectation of cost is. It really is circumstantial and we need to determine what is appropriate to, to ensure we have confidence in our own processes. Um, that's something that we have capacity to deal with. What I think Lord Mayor was talking about, there are many councils in country councils, for example, that have seriously limited capacity um, and an income cost like this would, would be significant for them and would be difficult for them to maintain. So I think there is, I, I understand that as we are the capital city council, we need to demonstrate best practice. I believe we do that already. Um, um, and, but that best practice, um, if, it's, if, it's, if it's required to be put onto all councils throughout South Australia, may be problematic for those smaller councils that have no ability to finance it. So, um, I, 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 I believe that from a city council point of view, we apply best practice at the moment voluntarily and we do that very well. Being required to do so and requiring the entire sector to do so could be problematic. Thanks, Mark. And reform area three, any councillors have any comments on reform area three? Councillor Sims. Thanks, Chair. It's a question. I, I note um, here suggests that two measures not be supported due to impact on strategic relationships, resources and or voters. You've got here in relation to automatic enrolment of property franchise holders to all councils. You require all groups and bodies, uh, bodies corporate to nominate a natural person to exercise their vote. Why would we not support that? Um, I think the likely uh, regulatory impact and burden for those um, voters and the um, resource impact of us trying to exhort them to nominate a natural person, sorry, through the chair, um, uh, we think to diminish voter numbers and eligibility, and that was the concern there. So the issue, so at the moment, the practice is that a, a, a business owner can exercise several votes in effect, can't they, through different, through different people? So we, this would actually close that off by ensuring that they have to nominate a natural person. I mean, I would have thought that that's actually the sort of democratic reform that we should support. You know, one vote, one value, irrespective of, you know, um, whether you're uh, a, a big property developer in the city or whether you're a resident, I would have thought you should have the same uh, influence over the election process. I, I might just add through the chair. Um, so, City of Adelaide already have automatic enrolment. We're the only council that has that already. Um, so, businesses and franchises are already on our roll. Um, the change, and this has been um, suggested by EXA, um, is that we, before the voters' roll is complete, that we would go out to all business owners to get them to nominate a natural person. So someone that has multiple businesses across the city beforehand could say, this is my natural person for all seven businesses. Um, then that information comes back in to the City of Adelaide, we do our voters roll and those voting packs go to that natural person ready for the vote. That, that's a change in the process now. We don't ask for a natural person before the vote. When the voting packs go out to that business owner, then they have to nominate a person there. So it's a just slight change in the process. The administration comment in there is just a, a risk of when we do go out for that natural person, if we don't get those forms back, that person will lose however many votes. So it might make the voters' role smaller before the election begins. Personally, I think we should support that because I think it's important that the vote is actually exercised by someone who is identifiable. I think that's a very important uh, democratic principle. I can understand that's why the Electoral Commission has put that forward. Um, so my view is we shouldn't be opposing that. We should actually say, yeah, let's make that happen. Um, because at the moment, it's often struck me that that process is um, open to uh, manipulation because of the lack of 
lack of clarity, the failure to request that someone actually nominate a clear person to exercise the vote, I think is, is problematic. Admiral Thank you. Just a moment. Um, there are two things that aren't addressed in here that it would be good if we could consider. And one is electronic voting. Um, and even if we could put forward that the City of Adelaide is a pilot area, so rather than bringing in electronic voting across the state, which may be too, too difficult to put in place in the time frame or too expensive in a, in a, a single verse, that we could uh, nominate ourselves to have electronic voting for our ratepayers. Um, the second thing is, um, which I've um, briefly mentioned before, is um, if with other layers of government, everybody's quite used to going to a polling booth on the day. Um, and I would like to suggest, again, I'm happy for us to be a demonstration or a pilot area, but that the City of Adelaide or other councils, if they wish, can actually have a designated polling area. So for instance, we may have three areas, one in south, one in the north, and one in the centre of the city that people can go to personally on the day and vote as opposed to have to, you know, fill in a form and remember to mail it and everything else. And there's such a period of time before when people get their voters pack and when the closing of voting that most people, have, a lot of people say that they've lost it. Um, we get lots of people that come back in and want another uh, voting pack, etc. Or they, it, it just gets sort of lost in the busyness of our lives. And I think if we could set up um, designating polling booths, that we'd get a much higher voter turnout because people know that they, they are used to that on other levels of government. And I think we that would um, be a great way to demonstrate how people can access us through an election process. Councillor Martin. Um, yeah, just a couple of things. A quick question first. Uh, in respect of electronic voting, um, which I support, is it, is it the correct understanding that EXA has already said that is not on the table because it cannot guarantee the integrity of it? Uh, that's correct. They've said that they're interested, uh, through the chair, they're interested in that um, in future. However, they don't think they can um, guarantee that uh, integrity at present. Uh, they have indicated that there are some, uh, they're seeking some flexibility to provide people in certain restricted circumstances with an electronic voting pack or ballot. Um, but only in very restricted circumstances, yeah. but not, um, you know, as we would envisage an online voting yep. system. Okay. Yet, which is not to say never, but just saying yet, but hence um, a proposal that might look at that um, as a demonstration site or a trial for City of Adelaide um, would seem a good uh, interim proposal. The April position of Council was to propose um, online voting. Um, but that, that hasn't been incorporated in these proposals. Because of the ex uh, Because of the ex Yeah. Okay, and uh, just to make absolutely crystal clear in my mind, the issue related to um, automatic enrolment of property franchise holders, we are not saying that the principle of one vote, one value changes in any way. It is simply an administrative measure to ensure that those eligible have an opportunity to nominate a natural person. Okay, that's correct. Okay, well, I'm happy with that. Um, uh, can I just also say in terms of feedback that I support um, the uh, recommendation in respect of publication of informal meetings um, and um, provisions to make sure that formal meetings um, do not take the place of a formal meeting. Um, we have, as you know, at the City of Adelaide, informal CEO briefings. Um, they, are, they do not require publication of an agenda. Uh, they do not require publication of any outcomes, uh, which sometimes are as simple as uh, the CEO asking, how do you feel about this? Um, which is, in my view, and always has been something that ought to be publicly available. Um, and secondly, um, I support entirely uh, the point that Councillor uh, Simmons uh, was seeking to raise in respect of informed meetings of court groups um, prior to council meetings or informal meetings uh, designed to get around the court provisions of the local government act and i think there should be uh, penalties associated with that 
So final comments on reform area three. We've got Councillor Canole followed by Councillor <coughs> Um Just in regards to the polling booths, I mean, that certainly is a reasonable idea. I just think uh, if it's going to be something, it may be something convenient and maybe for the period of the election rather than necessarily polling booth at the end. It's also I just find it going to be interesting because we have postal voting and you've got that. That means you're now going to have to go through as well to make sure that somebody hasn't done the postal vote as well as done a, a vote there. I mean, I don't know if it's uh, so you send the one in and you, you go vote to the other, you know, something may go be in the mail, whatever, I'm not sure. Anyway, just that. Um, and also, I suppose if we're talking about uh, meetings, I'm intrigued. Um, I mean, in this day and age where we can communicate in all fashions, I mean, I don't know what is or isn't a, a, a core at meeting um, in the sense that, you know, when you gather people together uh, at a particular function, etc., at what point uh, is something in particular called a meeting? So I suppose, uh, you know, and if you're talking about the weather, um, you know, at what point does that make, make any difference to the council? So it is about, it, it means it's very difficult to, to structure something um, to prevent something when it's very hard, you know, uh, well, there's no, there's nothing around it that you can say, well, you know, this meeting was for a purpose. Um, you know, how are you going to do that? I, I, I don't know, see the value in that. Councillor Sims. Very happy to respond to Councillor Canole's um, question. The, the reason why um, informal uh, core at meetings are problematic. Councillor Sims, I think we just have to provide feedback. Well, I'm uh, providing feedback to administration, um, to administration. by way of uh, addressing the concerns that Councillor <laughs> Canole has um, raised. One of the reasons why I think um, that's a, uh, an important uh, thing for us to reflect in our submission is that um, if you have an informal meeting, then um, that provides an opportunity for a councillor to um, form a preconceived position on an issue before they've actually heard a debate in the chamber, which is in breach of the, um, the Local Government Act. So um, to answer uh, Councillor Canole's um, question, that's why it's an important principle for us to include in our submission, I think. To, uh, on the Lord Mayor's um, <coughs> comment about uh, polling um, day, I, I actually think that would be a really interesting idea to, to look at because one of the challenges we have in um, local government elections is trying to get the community out to vote and, and to be engaged. Um, so yes, I th think that is something we should definitely um, look at. On the proviso that we would also need, of course, for um, the government to consider um, authorizations of election materials and how things like how the votes would operate and all that kind of stuff. And um, so if we move into that space, then there are obviously there's some different work that we need to be done. Yeah, yeah through the electoral commission. But um, I think it's a really interesting idea. Anything that gets more people out to vote, and electronic voting, absolutely. And finally, a question, Councillor Abrams. Yeah, just just um, a question based on um, what we were discussing before around nominating a natural person. So let's say if, if, a, uh, if a business owner has three businesses, um, how, how much time do they have to uh, nominate that natural person? Um, uh, you know, if, if they nominate someone, I don't know, 12 months or six months in advance, and when it comes to election times, and that person is no longer there, that natural person is no longer there, what happens to that vote? Uh, through the chair, so no timeframes have been proposed at this stage. Um, my assumption would be there'd be a time frame before the voters' roll is complete. So under the current legislation, the voters' roll is complete and has to be signed off by the CEO, and that's within um, a period before the, the election material gets sent out. So I'm assuming that there'd be a designated time frame there that would have to go out. If no one, um, if they didn't get back to council and said this is the natural person for these ten six votes, the vote wouldn't be counted. So no one would get the vote. Can I can I just make a make a comment because here we are trying to engage with our community and try and encourage people to vote. And if we go and do something like this, that would discourage them to vote. So we're we're essentially stopping them from voting. So just something to be mindful of. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, and thank you very much, Jess and Sue. And moving on to our first item for consideration and recommendation to council, item 5.1, Sports Lighting in Gladys Elphick Park. Can I have a mover and a seconder? Moved by Councillor Aberdeen today. 
Seconded by Councillor Kouros. Councillor Abrina today, would you like to speak to the motion? Uh, yeah. Councillor Kouros. Anyone else? Um, I'd like to move an amendment. If amendment, I yes. Yeah. Um, and the amendment is simply the committee defers consideration of item 5.51, pending in principal agreement for the installation of the lighting towers. From the Civil Aviation Safety Authority. Yeah. And the operators of the State Rescue Helicopter Service. And a seconder, seconded by Councillor Sims. Do you wish to, do you want to just double check that, Councillor Martin, make sure, apart from once the typos are corrected, that that's as intended? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fine. Well, uh, I'll, I'll leave the that's spelling to be tidied up, but yes. in, yeah. in broad detail, that's it, yes. And would you like to speak to the motion? So yeah, the thank amendment. you. Um, just a quick question first, uh, and it's a minor issue, but I'll get it out of the road quickly. Page 34 has a huge black spot in it where something's been redacted. Can we know what it was? <laughs> uh, through the chair, that's just simply an email um, with my details and someone else's details. Okay. Yeah, just answering for, or asking them to provide those details that they've provided in that topic. But the details are there, as in, I'm, I'm not uh, prosecuting this, I'm just saying the details are already there. It was just your details that have been worked yes, out. Yes, that's right. Yes. Not secret details. <laughs> <laughs> I got advice, it was a good idea to take it out. Yeah, yeah, look, uh, thank, thank you, Chair. Look, I, I remember, um, and, and while well, I'm not suggesting this is anything uh, like the scale of it, but I do remember we spent more than a year um, thousands of hours of staff time on a, a lot of money uh, developing a proposal for a helipad not far from this location behind the RA, um, <coughs> only to have the Civil Aviation Authority uh, tell us at the very end of the process, no, you were never going to get approval for this um, because it was never going to fly um, in at what was then the uh, the flight path. and. That uh, that stuff up was, um, you know, uh, a considerable shock to all of us, and it did result in a review. Um, now, look, I, I should say I have no objections to this per se. It sounds pretty reasonable to me, um, but I'm just asking that instead of, as we say at paragraph 24, once all statutory approvals have been granted and the lights installed, SA Health and SACA will undertake testing of the lights to ensure there's no unacceptable risk to the RA or to the helicopter. And I'm just wondering if we can have those conversations um, beforehand and have in principle approval so that this can go ahead without any impediments. Um, and, and look, I, you know, I don't wish to um, be uh, overly emphatic about this, but that rescue helicopter is uh, vital uh, to this state. Uh, each year, it brings in hundreds of patients with life-threatening conditions, um, with crew, including medical staff. Uh, and as is noted in this document, there is the possibility of a, a risk associated with the need for an emergency landing in the vicinity of those towers. Um, I'm just asking that we go and get the in-principle approval, um, whether that's tomorrow, next week, the week after, um, just have that in-principle approval and everything will be tickety-boo. I'll sign off on this happily. Councillor Sims, you wish to speak? Reserve my right. Uh, Councillor Kerr. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, those, are, those are pretty uh, legitimate concerns. Has there been actual feedback from those bodies, authorities on these, on these lines already? Yes, thank you. Uh, through the Chair. Um, you see in paragraph 19, um, on the 2nd of September 2019, we've received a letter from SA Health um, that was indicating in principal support. Now, they see in that letter um, some different groups, including the Attorney General's Department, and that seemed obscure, but they actually manage Babcock 
services who are also CC'd in that, they managed the contract with the State Rescue Helicopter Service. So those groups were in attendance at that meeting that I attended and uh, we felt like we've given them as much information as we can to this point, um, including in paragraph 17 where some additions have been made to the lighting project. Um, and so we're now at a point where we feel like until those lights are up, they can't actually make um, a final decision as to what level of impact that would have. But we've made that um, agreement in principle that we will work together once those lights are up to just uh, test the level of impact and whether there needs to be some modifications, which may be as, as extreme as turning the lights off if the helicopter needs to um, leave. And I just want to make it clear that where I talk about the emergency landing in the report, that's actually the helicopter is empty except for the obviously the pilot. So there's no um, patient in the helicopter. So it's for if the helicopter takes off and it suddenly has an engine failure, um, it may then land in part 25, unfortunately. Um, and so it's just making sure that they could see those lights um, if need be, because that's where it usually takes off in that direction. So it doesn't impact so much the helicopter landing with a patient. Thanks. So, so that, um, just to be clear, you, what, what is the nature of the response as such from CASA? I understand they say health have given in principle support. CASA were present when this was uh, discussed. What, what is the nature of their actual, is it effectively in principle support already? Uh, yes, so because of the importance of actually the flight path, this whole matter through the development approval will have to be referred to a um, Commonwealth Minister. Um, transport to assess it from that perspective, but obviously understanding that the helicopter taking off landing would have a much bigger impact than actually the light towers in Park 25. So it's a fixture. Um, it's, it is the closest element of the parkland for a sporting facility to be in the flight park, but then Adelaide Oval is also in that flight path as well. And the, the uh, light towers at Adelaide Oval are 60 metres. Well, it, it, I'll just make the point, it seems that those bodies have final veto I and mean, they will undertake testing of the lights to ensure there's no unacceptable risk. I mean, I would, it would, surely that's going to happen anyway. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not really not trying to undermine Councillor Martin's concerns, which I think are very legitimate, um, but I guess that if that's happening anyway, and if it's, it's a bit redundant, then I mean, should, we, should we hold up the process a little bit? Councillor Abrams. That opened the floor. Uh, Councillor Abrams, eh? Thank you. Um, uh, I guess just one question, are we going to get an answer to, to all those concerns when we go through um, development approval? Will we get those answers? Um, so at this point we've got in principle agreement from SA Health who then at the, the last meeting that we had, we had the representatives of the people who managed the contract for the REH, who managed the REH and also who operate the helicopter service, the rescue helicopter service. So we've had in principle agreement already from all those groups. The, they're now saying that the next step will be once this project has been approved um, and once it's got development approval, which is where an assessment is undertaken then from an impact from a flight path perspective, not anything to do in relation to the hospital. Um, at that point, then, once the lights are up, would be the testing uh, second by the RAH. Thank you. So, so all the desktop reviews and all the desktop checks have been have been done. But until you go out and, uh, and actually install these uh, these lights, you're not going to be able to um, to see if there is an issue or if there is anything wrong that needs to be adjusted. So I can see that there's been some computer modelling done. There's been some uh, some other bits and pieces that have already been done. So it looks like they've, they've done their uh, uh, all their desktop research. It's just a matter of uh, going out and, and actually physically doing it. So uh, um, the next step would be to to uh, to go out and install them. And if there are any issues, then they can be adjusted. So. Yeah. Councillor Sim. Can I uh, look? I can circumvent this process. If the administration is saying to me, and it's not present in here, that there is in principle support from the operators of the uh, the rescue helicopter service and from CASA, which is not in here, if that approval is being received, if we had that, then I'll withdraw this motion. Happy to withdraw the amendment. Yeah, if that the one amendment. you'd like yeah. to withdraw the amendment. Council, you have to withdraw. So we withdraw the amendment and then we proceed with the original, original motion. Yeah.
which was moved by Councillor Abraham today. Does anyone who has not already spoken wish to speak, Lord Mayor? I was um, just going to ask whether you want to respond to that, because the way I read it is that we've got in principle from the operators of the State Rescue Helicopter Services and the CASA approval comes through with the development approval. Is that correct? So once we go to the development approval, then we get CASA approval before they can go ahead. So you will get the approvals of both bodies. No, no, I'm, the, the point that I was making in which the administration has clarified is that the State Helicopter Service, Rescue Correct. Service, and CASA have already given in principle approval. No, um, that's I'm watching their faces and yeah. their Ray, would you like to clarify or Sorry, Amy? That's why like I'm asking the clarification. Yeah. Yes, through the chair. Um, yes, so CASA is the one body that has looked at this proposal, but have said they'll give their final um, feedback in the development approval process. So they said they haven't said we supported the principle. That's correct. Yes, because that is triggered through the development approval process, and so CASA doesn't actually approve anything. I think they would provide advice as part of the review by the Commonwealth in relation to the impact on um, okay, transport. Okay, understood that. Yeah. And, and therefore, the state rescue helicopter, including pilots and so on, that they're all on board. Councillor Martin, would you like to ask a question, and would you like to use your microphone? Uh, I'm just seeking clarification. So uh, I'm uh, feeling better. I'm hearing that there is support, which, which I didn't glean from the documents. So I'm happy about that. I withdraw. Would anyone else like to speak to the motion who has not already spoken? Back to the mover to sum up. Sum up. All those in favour? All those against? That motion has passed. Moving on to item 5.2, the assignment of the lease tree climb. And we have a mover from Councillor Moran. We have a seconder, Councillor Martin. Councillor Moran, would you like to speak? Uh, no. Councillor Martin? No, just one quick question of clarification. Directors guarantee some things transfer across, I think. Through your presiding member, that's indeed correct. All the same terms and conditions. Uh, it's the same director. It's just that it was uh, when the company was developed, it came through as banks. They're now aligned it to the current business operations. Thank you. Any other questions from any other councillors or comments? Back to the mover to sum up. Councillor Moran. Oh, All those in favour of the motion. All those against. That motion has carried. We move on to. Item 5.3, West Franklin Stage 3. Can I have a mover of the motion? Councillor Moran and a seconder, Councillor Canole. Councillor Moran, would you like to speak to the motion? No. Councillor Canole. Anyone else? Councillor Martin. Well, quick, a quick question. Um, I read all the, the maps and things. That is the bit we're talking about. Yes, yeah, indeed, correct. Uh, the small section to the rear end on the Smith Street is correct. And by extinguishing the land management agreement, are we in any way treading on the rights of other property holders whose views may be diminished by the height of the building? I can't comment on other property owners, but what I can comment is it has been in front of SCAP and they consider that as part of their assessment. And also to bear in mind that we're not talking to stage two as the one that councillors are very interested in, which goes along with Franklin Street. So this is a very small parcel. It's been for a link to reach the LMA on stage one. Really, we have no grounds to not do this for stage two. Thank you. Does anyone else wish, wish to speak to the motion? Back to the mover to sum up. And that, all those in favour of the motion, all those against, that has carried. Item 5.4, social and affordable housing in the city, and Ian is going to give us a brief intro. <laughs> Sorry, thank you through the chair. Look, just a brief intro. This is a fairly um, dedicated piece of work put together by Nicole. I um, hope you've got a chance to read through it. Uh, I think, in, in summary, we are of the view internally here that we we do have a bit of a policy vacuum in this space. Um, there have been 30 odd years of various pieces of uh, intervention or incentives or work done by the City of Adelaide. I think the market has probably moved quite a lot uh, in terms of macroeconomic policy settings, um, social housing, affordable housing, community housing, owner-occupier incentives, um, rent to buy schemes. So there are a range of options that are out there at the moment. 
and I think we're of the view here internally that um, we're seeking to do some further scoping work to inform what we might do next in terms of a policy setting for the City of Adelaide um, and what that really does mean in a strategic sense for both um, social and affordable housing. But um, might leave some questions open direct to Nicole, who's uh, an expert and well-read on this uh, particular topic. Did anyone have any questions before we seek a mover into seconder? Councillor Sims. Uh, yes, just um, noting in the recommendations, there's a talk here about a policy position and uh, or a strategy. Could you just highlight um, for me what are the differences in terms of a policy and a strategy, what, what that nuance? Uh, through the chair, um, I guess as, um, as Diane mentioned, we're in a bit of policy vacuum. So um, the recommendation talks about building the evidence base, um, then having a policy position, um, and it would be covering off on all forms of housing. So this isn't just on affordable social housing, we're looking across the whole spectrum. Um, and then determining the roles and responsibilities of council and other players um, to clarify what action needs to be taken. So that's the strategy? That would be the strategy, the action piece. Thank you. Yeah. Right, through the chair, just to be really clear around that, on that strategy piece, that doesn't mean that we would necessarily be intervening in the market or investing in the market. But it is about identifying roles and responsibilities, whether they be state, federal, local, or, or NGOs. What role do they play in facilitating the outcomes? That's that's where we're coming from. Any other questions before we no. seeking a mover? Moved by Councillor Sims and a seconder, Councillor Moran and Councillor Sims. Do you wish to speak? Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, thanks, Chair. And I actually wanted to start by thanking administration for um, their work on this. I think this is a really substantial piece of work um, and um, there's some really useful information in there in terms of uh, detailing some of the options that uh, are available to us, but also I think providing some hard data on um, where we're at at the moment in terms of available evidence. So. Um, I just want to start by saying thank you for um, putting all of that together because I think it's really comprehensive. It's one of the things that really um, leaps out at me is the um, findings in the report on page 51 um, that talk about the way that uh, the current zoning regime works. And the, it's noted here that um, of uh, only five of 25 eligible projects, and have signed up to deliver an affordable housing. In addition, none of these projects have sold the designated affordable apartments to eligible buyers. They've subsequently been sold to investors in the open market. In theory, some 345 affordable housing apartments should have been delivered through the inclusionary zoning process and sold to eligible buyers, and that hasn't happened. Um, and that really identifies uh, for me that there's a, a serious problem um, for us that we need to, I think, um, play a leadership role in addressing. There's something very wrong if um, developers in our city are getting the benefits that come from um, this zoning um, regime, but they're not actually um, putting the investment in, in terms of making the affordable housing available. Um, there's also something very wrong if uh, there's not appropriate oversight to make sure that the affordable housing isn't um, meeting the, the needs of the market. So um, my view is I think we do need to look at um, mandating uh, some of this zoning, but we also need to look at what we can do to stop uh, this kind of housing being purchased by investors so that it's not addressing the, the real needs that we have in our city. Um, I think it's very clear that we need a structural reform of our housing system because housing is being used as a commodity. It's about a profit making mechanism rather than it being about people. And um, anybody who lives in the city of Adelaide will be aware of the huge issue that we have, and it's a growing issue around homelessness in our city. That is a direct consequence of failed government policy at state and federal level. Um, if you have people sleeping on the street in a country like Australia, um, with the resources that we have, then there is something seriously wrong. Um, and with the resources that we have collectively in the city, of Adelaide, it really saddens me to see that we have people in our community sleeping on the street, um, sleeping rough, people experiencing significant housing stress. So we need a structural change. 
Um, what I like about this uh, piece of work is that it gives the, if we approve this, um, it gives council administration um, the green light to do some more work in terms of scoping out what the options are. Um, and um, I think uh, gives us the potential to form a strong policy position so that if we do acquire strategic property in the future, we know that we you know, need to make allowance for um, social and affordable housing as appropriate. Um, and I think also um, helps us really play a leadership role uh, in dealing with this issue because I think it's a priority for every level of government. So I encourage members to support this and I look forward to the, the future work that will follow. Well, time to Councillor Moran. I'll reserve my life. Councillor, uh, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Um, look, I, I actually have an amendment um, that I put forward, and I did actually speak to Councillor Sims um, briefly on this this afternoon. Um, I absolutely agree that we need to develop a policy position um, home, on housing and homelessness. And, um, but I do think, and I, I also recognise it's a great piece of work, thank you. Um, um, the Mayor, let's get a seconder for your oh, amendment. Could I have a uh, councillor? My apologies, sorry, Chief. Um, um, so, and I would also uh, like us to investigate some of the innovative financing and delivery models that are out there at the moment, such as um, uh, build to rent and rent to buy, uh, which are already in place in other cities. So, um, as members know, that um, the, the two key issues that are on the uh, Capital City Council of Lord Mayors at the moment is housing and homelessness and climate action and mitigation. Um, uh, there was actually a um, uh, a summit last week in Melbourne, and that was all about each of the councillors developing a policy position, but not trying to take on the responsibility of uh, particularly around social and community housing, because that is very much a federal and state government responsibility. Um, so, uh, and there's a lot of um, um, and more to happen in terms of advocating for a national housing and homelessness strategy with appropriate funding and debt forgiveness to the various states. So there's a lot of work in trying, also recognising that the NAHA isn't working the way it should be in terms of service delivery for the community housing providers and wraparound services. Um, just as a bit of data, the ABS uh, stats in 2016 says there's 100, over 116,000 homeless people in Australia. Um, that is not sleeping rough, so 8,000 of those are sleeping rough. 6,000 of those homeless people in South Australia and in the city of Adelaide itself through the Zero Project, we know that the last count was 227. Um, and we are actually working with the state as part of their responsibility to actually find provision of housing. So I totally support the provision of more housing. I do think we have a role to play. I do think we need a very strong policy position and the policy or position will be able to inform how we work moving forward. Councillor Kouros. Councillor Martin. I'm just uh, struggling a bit. I wonder if the Lord Mayor would articulate for us what is the difference between her amendment and the original um, motion? Uh, she cannot answer that point of clarification, I don't believe. I'll just check. <laughs> is it a straight answer, Lord Mayor? <laughs> through, the, through the microphone, is it a straight answer? Um, it is a relatively straight answer in terms of um, the scoping exercise. I think a lot of that um, already exists. In fact, a lot of that's already in the, thing, in the paper. And I actually believe that we have enough to inform a policy position without actually having to go to a strategy, um, which then strategy has an implementation and an action plan with it. Um, and at the moment, because there is so much work happening in this area at a state and a federal level. I think if we had a really solid policy position at this point in time, and we can work through the housing and homelessness strategy in alignment with the state government while advocating for one at the federal level, that we will get what we need. Thank you. Councillor Sims. Yeah, I can't support um, this amendment. <laughs> and the, the Lord Mayor knows we, we've talked about, um, about this issue. Um, look, I, um, I think the strategy is an important component of this because the strategy is the how, the role that we can play in achieving um, more social housing and affordable housing. So I think that's really important. Um, but I also think um, that the scoping piece is important as well, because whilst I agree with the Lord Mayor that there is a lot of information um, out there, 
Um, I've been advised um, by administration that what um, is really lacking is a really thorough investigation around um, the diversity of need in the city, dealing with the issues around um, rental stress, dealing with the, um, the issues around homelessness, social housing, affordable housing, and that that can then inform future work. So whilst it will cost us a bit of money to do that, I think it is money worth spent. This um, at well spent, this council has um, recognised that homelessness is a crisis and one that we need to take um, urgent action on. Um, and with, with that in mind, I think it's appropriate that we allocate the resources necessary to do this work and that we don't just develop a policy position, but that we also have a clear strategy on how we're going to address this, how we're going to address the structural issues in our city that are leading to people sleeping on our streets. Councillor Connell. I mean, I see that uh, I mean, we're, a, we're a capital city, quite a small one in, in our size, and also we have what has happened so far hasn't worked. I mean, so this is a problem that is bigger than just us. And I think working together with all those people who are going to be delivering uh, the solutions is far more important because we may not be able to deliver it within the city, uh, uh, you know, square because of the, the cost constraints and all the other reasons why people haven't done it and, and putting that as some artificial uh, requirements uh, may skew it even worse uh, and therefore maybe even constrain the uh, people actually building things and maybe it may come at least to affordable level, maybe not to social level, but we may be able to accommodate that in the wider city context uh, where they will be able to uh, do appropriate uh, and commercially viable buildings um, you know, at least be able to do work some models that will deliver those those outcomes uh, without necessarily imposing uh, it specifically upon us. So it is about a, a collaborative effort. I mean, all of the homelessness and that has happened that way. I mean, the Dunstan Foundation has done a fantastic job, but it is it's broader than just here. And I think we need to have a conversation with all the stakeholders and then how we are going to deliver that because people have to build it and they're going to have to uh, have a model around that that actually makes it uh, workable and forcing uh, something in the commercial sense uh, doesn't work. And I think uh, it certainly is uh, quite acceptable to do that because the strategy may mean something outside of the city uh, for certain aspects of it where we can deliver other aspects inside. But first we're going to find out what that looks like. Councillor Abraham today. Councillor Abraham today. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've got a uh, question about point two. So it investigates innovative financing and delivery models for social and affordable housing. Um, I don't know whether the administration can, can answer this or not, but would you have a rough idea on what that would look like? What are we, what are we looking for? Uh, through, the, through the chair, um, some of the models um, that are mentioned in the report and kind of the partnership um, opportunities are quite complex from a finance perspective um, and subsidies perspective. And um, some of the models get income from the Commonwealth Government through the Commonwealth Rental Assistance and, and different things like that. So it's looking at um, the the investment part of it and also the operational part of it and it's a cocktail of different funding models usually so i think what we're trying to achieve there is to investigate that a little bit more um sort of drill down on what the the um, options might be as well as the models that are already established like the build to rent rent to buy that kind of thing yeah okay um I guess just, just, just for the benefit of other members, I might just um, quickly touch on this. Um, so under the Local Government Act, um, under Section 161, which talks about uh, uh, rate rebates in relation to community services, um, there are already uh, uh, rate rebates in place for public housing com and community housing. Um, so, so what's the percentage of that rebate? Uh, through, through the chair. Um, most of the tier one community housing providers get a 75% rebate um, as a community service provider and then council has the discretion to provide an additional 25%. So a lot of them already get 100% rate rebate. And, and uh, does that apply to public housing um, providers as well? So the South Australian Housing Trust as well? Uh, no, they don't pay rates. I don't believe so. No, no government department pays rates. Well, the question is, question is 
Um, I, I'm not sure. I just can't remember off the top of my head. Sorry. I, I think I think you're right. Um, I know when the um, the government transferred the stock, the housing choice of stock to council. Um, there was some question. I'm not sure. Some administration. In so, so my understanding is that. If, oh, sorry. No, 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 go on. So my understanding is that if it goes from public housing to community housing. Uh, then that rate rebate applies. And again, my understanding is, is actually the, the opposite. So uh, um, I might not be understanding it right or there might be something missing. But uh, my understanding is that mm. when the housing trust owns it, they, pull, they, they pay the full rate. Yes. But when it goes to community housing, they get that 75% uh, rate rebate. That's correct. Yeah, it's, it's come back to me now. That's right. <laughs> yes. Well, at least the government's still there with that. It's, it's nice to hear. Um, uh, and I guess just, just one more, just one more point. If I can speak about uh, the diversity of issues, Councillor Sims, you, you pointed uh, you pointed this out. And uh, there are uh, you know a, a large number of issues when it comes to homelessness. Uh, and I've uh, um, and I know that you know many other members here have spoken about this. I think the role that we play as a council is uh, is one of facilitation. Um, you know, you need, you need to speak with SA Health. You need to speak to. Um, Department of Human Services, you need to speak to the housing agency. So there's there's lots of uh, stakeholders that are involved and I think we need to facilitate those conversations and bring everyone around the table. Um, uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to uh, uh, support this amendment uh, and I'm keen to see uh, uh, what comes at the end of it. And I've got Councillor Moran, Councillor Cara, followed by a question from the Lord Mayor. Councillor Moran. Uh, yes, I won't be supporting the amendment because I think it weakens <clears throat> weakens our thrust to um, solve this um, catastrophic situation. I was disappointed to see that the developers in, I think it was in Day, are not happy to continue with with building affordable housing and so forth. That's a massive step backwards with all the concessions they're given in the state. That's the very least that they could do to give back. Um, I'd, if if uh, the Lord Mayor's motion was up as the suggested motion, I haven't seen the other one, I would have voted for it. It's going in the same direction, but it's not as detailed. And one of the things I, I will miss about it is the scoping. Now, can you explain to um, me and the others what, what the rationale behind the scoping exercise was? Um, through the chair, perhaps if I can just explain um, the, the um, focus of, of the, the scoping exercise is really um, heading towards a, a housing needs assessment. So that's kind of the main part of it. So that's the evidence base that would then support the policy development. So I think um, maybe the, the wording um, has thrown people a little bit, um, but um, the, the housing need assessment is really kind of best practice approach to developing a housing strategy. And that seems to be um, the way that um, current research is, is thinking um, and um, other councils are approaching this, this issue. Well, I think that's a cat catastrophic deletion um, in the uh, amendment. I think oh, we oh, might have, Councillor Moran, I think we might have some question if you're happy to about catastrophic things. Um, I did actually uh, ask a question just a minute ago, which I am, um, and I'm sorry. Lord Mayor, sorry, I've in interrupted Councillor Moran. Would you like to re remove your amendment or would you I like to, say to withdraw the amendment yep. based on the clarification around the scoping exercise and the cost of the scoping exercise. Are you happy to pause and come back, Councillor Moran? Oh, yes, yes, no, I'm happy. <laughs> so you're withdrawing your amendment? No, I just wanted some, based on clarification of the scoping and the cost, which I believe is around $30,000, that will deliver us the policy that we need, which I totally, I mean, I am in is serious a question lobby. So question. based on that, I would be happy to withdraw the amendment from number one, thanks. So if you could clarify that question for us. Um, through the chair, um, look, to date, I've, I've got some information um, on a ballpark figure of around 30,000 to 40,000 um, to do the housing needs assessment. Um, the policy, you know, maybe an additional cost or we could do it in-house, we'd, we'd need to sort of address that at the time. Um, but I think, um, you know, under 50,000 would, would be a reasonable guess. So based on that, Lord Mayor, are you removing your um, amendment. Based on that, I will remove the amendment because we actually do need a policy position. We've been actually doing a lot of work in this area and we need the, the assessment to inform the policy. Councillor so I'm sorry, I needed some other information before. Question. 
Can I, can I clarify you're removing the entire amendment? And Councillor Kouros, can I have a question before? You need to answer your, your whether or not you're going to support the removal of the amendment, and then I can answer. Well, I'm going to leave another amendment. You can't move another amendment? Well, you, you, we have to wait for this one. But so okay. the question is, do you support, as the seconder of the amendment, do you support the removal of the amendment? No. You do not. So then we continue the debate on the current amendment. Councillor okay. Kerr. Thanks. Um, it's just a question, um, and, and this isn't a this isn't a, a partisan thing, or it's not really about undermining. Or it's just it, 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 everything seems to be about, it's about the needs assessment, as whether we have uh, we pay and forty thousand dollars for a needs assessment. I'm develops the the amendment that the Lord Mayor put forward um, seem reasonable to me because it says it says develops a policy position uh, it does not which does not preclude us looking at uh, all of the factors that go into a policy it doesn't if this this is not a policy we are not being asked to put forward a formulated policy position here and now if the word says develops a policy position the original one but but it's about the but 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 Anne, it's about the and, talking to and, the and debate, a, Councillor Kerr. Are you answering a question? I, I am. I am uh, asking the question of administration. Uh, well, I, I, but I'm, I mean, I should be. Okay, you can right, continue to debate, or you can ask a question yeah, of I'll administration. Do, I'll do both. I'll do both. Um, uh, and it's about the it's about the needs analysis. It's the forty thousand dollars. The question is. Isn't a needs analysis uh, something material that the state and federal governments can already provide us? Through the chair, um, the, the state government has provided um, a degree of that information through the, the audit that they've done as part of the um, current strategy development. Um, my understanding that it doesn't go down to the level of detail that, um, that we would, would need because it, that's looking at more a metro level and we're looking at more of a, a local government area level and the circumstances in the city are quite different to metro Adelaide so as you would know there's the high rate of homelessness we've got student housing that's come on but a lot of apartments that have come on the how the nature of housing in the city is quite different it's changed quite rapidly over the last 10 years so it's kind of getting a handle on, on all of that and really drilling down to see what the issues are um, so, so you need the forty thousand dollars to do the needs analysis before we can develop a policy position. Is really what you're, what, 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 it's, it's is really, really what you're saying. Yes, yeah, yeah, you, you need the forty thousand dollars to do the needs analysis. The information is not readily available from the state and federal government uh, on this. We need to spend the forty thousand dollars needs analysis before we can develop a policy position. Let's, let's be clear. Can I just pause there and turn to Ian for some clarification? Sorry, Chair, just at the risk of entering the debate, which I'm not going to. Um, apologies, I think this is so good. Thank you, you. Thank you Councillor. <laughs> um, I think we've probably just confused with some of the terminology in the report, in the recommendation in particular. There's words around scoping, uh, needs analysis, policy and strategy. So just to give a bit of clarification around that, um, we recognise there's a policy vacuum and there's a, there is a need to develop a consistent policy for the City of Adelaide as an administration and as a council. The needs analysis is a specific piece of work related to our jurisdiction, drawing on some of the work done by state government and others and other models that exist both here and in the state to inform um, a, a policy position. And we are, will be seeking circa uh, thirty to $40,000 to do that specific piece of work to inform the policy. I hope that clarifies things. Oh, sorry, and, and absolutely deliver. We're very conscious of timelines here. We are not looking for an elongated process here. We are looking to bring in something fairly, um, fairly early in the new year around policy shaping. Thank you. And just to clarify, Councillor Kouros, you are still not happy to support the withdrawal of the amendment. I have a really hard time because I understand what you're saying, Ian, and, and we want to develop a, a policy position regarding... No, we can't enter into the debate, so oh, either no. you can support the withdrawal or not. We're actually not letting the Lord Mayor withdraw. I just get a grip, Anne. Councillor Kouros, Councillor Kouros, that's fine if you're, happy, if you're saying you would prefer not to support the withdrawal. Then we go to the vote, unless any councillors who have not already spoken would like to comment on the amendment. What are we voting on? We're yeah. voting on the amendment. 
with no other comments from councillors, then we take this to the vote. All those in favour of the amendment? All those against? <laughs> that amendment is lost. So then we go back to the original motion. Anyone who has not already spoken, would anyone like to speak? Um, Councillor Moran moves it to be put. I second that. Can I amend something on this motion here? No, you cannot make an amendment. Councillor Moran has moved the motion to be put. Councillor Martin seconds the moving of the motion to be put. All those in favour? All those against? Oh, this, this, that is carried. No discussion on the matter. Now voting on the motion. All those in favour? All those in favour of the motion? All those against? That is carried. Moving on to item 5.6, Chinatown Lunar New Year Street. Sorry, 5.5, correction. Adelaide Parklands Building Design Guidelines. Do I have a mover? Councillor Martin and a seconder? Councillor Moran. Councillor Martin? Ah, okay, I need a, sec a uh, seconder of the motion. I have a mover, a seconder, Councillor Sims. Councillor Martin, do you wish to speak to the motion? Um, a quick question first. Um, I've read the yeah, I've read the document. Um, I couldn't find the undercroft reference. It's been recorded. Uh, through the chair, um, Councillor Martin, there is no reference under undercrofting where it says where the statement goes along the lines of a page right in front of it, but it refers to where appropriate undercrofting will be considered. Okay, thank you. Um, look in page 48. 48, thank you. Um, look, may uh, I say thank you to the administration uh, for uh, meeting with us separately and for taking on board everybody's feedback, formally and informally. Um, I think this document is ready for consultation. Um, I'm happy with the references with regard to footprint. I'm happy uh, with regard to building consolidation and the parking references. Um, I thank you very much and um, I commit it to everyone. Councillor Sims, do you wish to speak? Just actually to thank you. Oh, oh, my microphone wasn't working for a second there. You could all breathe, breathe a sigh of relief, um, but it yeah. is working. Um, I actually just want to thank Councillor Martin for um, raising some of the issues that, that he did um, previously. Um, I think that was very helpful in terms of um, providing a bit more um, detail. So thank you for that. And um, thank you to administration for uh, taking it on board. I think this is a good document. Councillor Kerr. Uh, thanks, an amendment. An amendment. Thank you, Will Chair. Uh, same as last time, so at the end, uh, uh, removing uh, at objective, sorry, um, removing the word uh, contemporary uh, from ah. objective 4.1. Uh, so this is right at the end, yeah, at the end of two. Approves after approved, da, 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 after 2019, yet yeah, removing, uh, yes, subject to removal uh, of the, the word contemporary from uh, objective 4.1 in the, in the heading. What's that word? <laughs> Get a closer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I feel at the end of the meeting. Uh, from the from the heading and the first sentence. And can I have a seconder? Council Curris. 
Councillor Kerr, would you like to speak uh, to thanks, the amendment? I will. Uh, look, uh, we, we went through it last time. It's the same thing. It, uh, it simply, it, it does not prevent, this doesn't prevent contemporary designs. It just prevents the dictating of a design as being contemporary, uh, which may throw off some people from putting up a design that uh, is perhaps more traditional in form. Um, as the Lord Mayor said, if it's, a, if it's a beautiful design, it's a beautiful design. There's no need to actually dictate that it must be contemporary. So uh, it shouldn't necessarily always be a box with things sticking up. Um. Councillor Kurtz. <coughs> Lord Mayor. Um, I just want to talk um, or ask a question on page 63, um, where we say in one, two, three, four, five, the sixth paragraph, which says promote an integrated approach to site planning and building design. Um, the there's a line that the bit that's highlighted said with objective to reduce overall building footprint in parklands. Um, that is, to my understanding, we do that when we're trying to do a consolidation in the park. So when we talked about the instances where we did where we do that is where we've gone into a park and there's three buildings and we consolidate those into one building and we look to um, to reduce the footprint that's within that park. I'm not sure that if we put that in, um, so for instance, um, I'm, I'm just trying to think of a, an instance, maybe sort of um, archery in in North Adelaide, where it's not a consolidation of buildings, but they, they have something that's not fit for purpose. Um, and then the guideline says that we're actually um, trying to reduce the footprint for, for that. that. That's actually going to be a problem. So, I just, I just think Lord Mayor, that it's been to the amendment at this point. So we're talking to the amendment by Well, I'm just not taking care of an amendment. So um so I'm just asking, is that going to that um highlighted thing, is that actually going to be So you wouldn't be able to bring us amendment until, until, is, until we've dealt with then, this one? Then I was going to add something to his amendment should he um allow me to, um, which would be after Parkland's comment when consolidation is being investigated in our park. If I can um, do that. Through the chair, I'll attempt to answer that question. So when we met last week, there was a, a significant amount of conversation around the subject of um, consolidation and reduction of footprint. Um, one of the things we talked about was that the Adelaide Park Plans management strategy actually looks at reducing footprint of buildings within the parklands. Yes. Um, and the intent behind the wording that we have now incorporated in there is to reflect what the APNMS uh, is, is attempting to achieve. Okay. Oh, okay. So you don't think that requires any other wording to achieve that? And that it's clear whoever picks up the document to read it? Um, through the chair, the document is a guideline document, yep. so we would assess each site, each park, each proposal on, on depend, depending on each circumstance. So one circumstance where there's a, a number of buildings that are scattered, we would look at consolidation. Um, in another example, uh, that may not be possible, and so we would assess it on its merits. Um, in that case, I don't need another amendment, and I support the amendment that's been put forward. Does anyone else wish to speak to the amendment? Councillor Martin? Look, just briefly to say, um, I don't really want to participate in Councillor Kira's war on modernity. Um, the word con contemporary is not offensive in no, any way, no um, and indeed uh, uh, to exclude it um, doesn't really serve any purpose. Uh, if design is still the outcome, uh, then I am happy about that. Uh, and let me reiterate that I'm uh, happy with the document as it is. I think it's a, um, a good outcome. Does anyone else wish to speak to the amendment? Back to Councillor Karen. Thanks. Uh, in summing up, it's not about excluding uh, contemporary at all. At the moment, the way that the document reads, the document dictates, mandates, stipulates, uh, forces any design, uh, potential design, to be contemporary. It, it puts a shackle on the kind of designs that we may otherwise receive. Removing the word 
does not prevent contemporary designs whatsoever from coming in. And we all know there is no way that the vast majority of designs that will come uh, will not be contemporary <coughs> any, anyway. So I think, unfortunately, with all respect, Councillor Martin, there's a bit of hyperbole. Uh, this, is, this is just uh, removing a constraint. That's all it is. All those in favour of the amendment? All those against? That is carried. So now moving to the substantive. The amendment becomes the substantive. Anyone wish to speak to it who has not already spoken? Back then to the initial. I'm allowed to sum up. But... Yes, back to the mover to sum up. Sum up. <laughs> All those in favour? All those against? That is carried. Moving on to item 5.6, Chinatown, Lunar New Year Street Party. Can I have a mover? Councillor Abu Kimzadeh and a seconder, Councillor Ho. Councillor Abu Kimzadeh, do you wish to speak? Councillor Ho. Well, I just like. I uh, just like to say, thank the admin. I think well, there's another ten thousand dollars for it, and because I, I know the those like, I know the organisation quite well. I know that they have the passion, but they don't have the skills. And it's good that like if the admin can take care of it. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to speak, Councillor Martin? Just a quick question. Um, the administration has expressed concerns to the Open Council on previous occasions about financial matters concerning um, acquittals, particularly related to Chinatown. Do those concerns persist? Craig, would you like to answer that? Um, the, the acquittals have gone through our, our sponsorship area. Um, I'm not aware of those concerns, but I can certainly investigate that for you. The CEO raised it last yeah. time. Does he have those concerns? Did you have any other comments to add, Mark? Or we can take that on notice? No, look, I, I don't know the current status, but I'm happy to take that on notice. If there's any problems, we'll come back to you. Okay. Look, I, um, I know, um, uh, let, let me just say uh, at the outset, by the way, that any event in the city that encourages cultural diversity is a great thing, and this is in itself a great event. Uh, having said that, I do think it's worth noting, and particularly for the benefit of newer members, that just two years ago, the allocation for the Lunar New Year project was $15,000 a year. In the lead up to the election last year, uh, the Deputy Lord Mayor, as he is now, um, proposed that there be a one-off $15,000 increase. That morphed into a $30,000 annual budget in the current uh, budget process. That has now morphed into $40,000. So about a 150% increase in a couple of years. I invite everyone to just consider that that $40,000 now is a very substantial amount, particularly when it's concerned uh, compared to events like Oz Asia, which begins this week and which runs for two weeks and which brings huge crowds into the city. And I'm talking about tens of thousands, particularly for the, uh, the Moon Lantern Parade, which is scheduled, I think, for the weekend after next there are measurable, substantial outcomes for the city. And therefore, before we start allocating a 150% increase to any event, not just this one, in the city, I think there needs to be some measurable outcomes. AusAsia delivers those outcomes in buckets. For $25,000 a year extra, um, I would like to see a bit more of a uh, response from the administration about how much bang we get for our buck. Certainly, uh, through the chair, um, Oz Asia, yeah, it, yes, is a, a big event, a substantial event, and backed also with funding through state government and our own sponsorship program. So it's a much larger scale event in a uh, time of the year that they are able to stretch it over two weeks. So whilst comparing the two events, I think one's quite a smaller event compared to a larger event. That's, that's pretty much what it is. However, measurements, etc., we need to ensure uh, I'll start, um, Chair, by saying that I, I do support um, this. I think it's worthwhile to support events like this in the city. I do have to point out, though, it's, it's interesting that we tied ourselves in knots around a discussion about approving thirty to forty thousand dollars for a needs analysis or a scoping uh, document to get a policy together on dealing with social housing and affordable housing, so that we can address the crisis 
crisis of homelessness in our city. And yet, when I saw this come up, I saw a lot of councils delighted to approve the increase of funding. And as I say, I'm very happy to do so, but I think it's important that we reflect um, on the uh, inconsistency sometimes that is taken when it comes to approving uh, funding, because um, this isn't a small amount of money. I think it's a worthy um, cause, and I'm happy to support the investment, but ne let's not then balk when um, there are suggestions for um, money to be spent on investigating uh, things like um, housing in our city. Councillor Kouros. I just want to point out that 80% uh, of the rates are paid to our city are by businesses. So by supporting events like this is supporting the businesses within that community. So I think it's money well spent. Um, and um, I understand Councillor Sim's point, but I kind of think the two match together in regards to what the spend is here. Do any other councillors wish to speak to the motion? Back to the mover to summer. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just, just very quickly for those members who may not have uh, attended uh, the events in the previous years, I think as the years have gone by, the event has gotten bigger and better. So if you haven't uh, attended one of these uh, events, then do yourself a favour, come along and uh, uh, enjoy it and support the community at the same time. Thank you. All those in favour and against, that is carried. Moving on to yeah. item 5.6, the 2019 LGA Annual General Meeting Papers. 5.7, apologies. 2019 LGA Annual General Meeting Papers. Can I have a mover, Councillor Sims, and a seconder, Councillor Moran? Does anyone wish to speak to the motion? No. All those in favour? Against? That is carried. And moving on to council member discussion forum items. Item number six, does anyone have any items for discussion? Well, I'll just mention that it is Ride to Work Day tomorrow uh, and there will be a pop-up bikeway along Peary Street, which is very exciting, tomorrow morning. Uh, and a breakfast at Hindmarsh Square. So I hope to see everyone there. Councillor Sims, did you have something else to add? Yeah, just to um, let members know that today uh, I had a meeting with um, some representatives from a gambling um, reform uh, organisation um, who uh, wanted to convey their thanks to council for the leadership position that it took on No Accept Pokies. And um, these were people who had had um, their lives destroyed by pokey machines had lost you know huge amounts of money and that it had huge consequences for them and their families um, and they were very appreciative of the leadership role that council has played on that so i just wanted to convey that to me any other council discussion items no, moving on to item seven exclusion of the public uh, can I first of all have a mover for item seven, item 8.1 to exclude, and that is moved by Councillor Abraham today and a seconder, the Lord Mayor. All, any <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Abraham today, do you wish to speak to the motion? Lord Mayor, do you wish to speak to the motion? Anyone else wish to speak? All those in favour? No. Against, <laughs> that is carried. <laughs> so any member of the public present and staff not associated with item 8.1, could you please now leave the meeting room whilst the committee considers the next items on the agenda.
Good job, Thank you, councillors. That concludes the business of this meeting of the committee. And as there are no other items of business, I declare the meeting closed.